Hello, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to the Spirit of the Railroaders interview with Rob Krebs. We're in his home, he and Ann's home in Lake Forest, Illinois, and it is June 10th, 2020. Um, and uh, uh, we are um, going to have a hopefully a lively conversation about Rob's 35 year career in the railroad business. Our goal is with this program is to gather oral histories of those people who have uh, made an impact and uh, contributions to the industry. Um, and uh, with Rob's long history in the business, um, we want to uh, we want to make sure that we properly uh, record and document those experiences that he had coming up through the ranks uh, into the leadership of, of the company um, in dealing with uh, not only becoming the head of Southern Pacific, but then going through the complexity and obstacles to getting the merger done with, uh, with Burlington Northern um, and Santa Fe. So um, we felt it important to get it on the record here and uh, about your career and, uh, and your views and comments on the events that you encountered going through all of that uh, in your time in the business. Um, working in chronological order, if we can, starting at the beginning, uh, maybe when you were growing up in Sacramento, um, and just talk a little bit about your experiences there. And I think one of the questions that if you can weave into that is, um, you by reputation clearly have a strong work ethic, um, and a commitment to, uh, to doing the job. And, and I guess the, the, the question related to that is, did that come from your parents? Is that something you generated on your own? How did, how did you become who you are? Yeah. Okay. Books. Well, my parents had a lot to do with it. Uh, Unfortunately, I was a, a very, a very entitled child, um, an only child. I thought that was a detriment, but I found out later uh, when we had three of our own children that maybe it wasn't so bad to be an only <laughs> child. I grew up in Sacramento. I thought the sun rose and set in Northern California. Uh, that's where I always wanted to be. I went to, uh, my dad moved around. He worked for Wells Fargo Bank, American Trust at the time. And about every three years we moved from one branch bank to another branch bank, we maybe moved 20 miles, but for me, it was like starting all over again with finding new friends and meeting new kids. And I swore I'd never go to work for a big company and put my kids through that, which is exactly what I did do. Um, but anyway, we settled in Sacramento. I went to CK McClatchy Senior High School, 2,300 kids, public school, um, three, three grades, senior high school, 65% of those kids went on to four-year colleges. I got a great education. I uh, went right into Stanford. I had no trouble whatsoever. And another thing I thought at the time, why would I ever send my kids to uh, private schools? Because that school system was uh, the envy of every, uh, every state in the, the United States. Uh, my dad um, I was, was a banker, tried and true. And uh, I watched him and I thought I wanted to be a banker. And uh, then when it came time after I finished Stanford, I decided to go to business school. Uh, and I went back east to Harvard. I, um, uh, I didn't like the East Coast as much as I like California. It just convinced me I want to go back to California. My dad told me <clears throat> if I was going to be a banker, I had to go to New York because that's where all the action was. It was the global finance center of the world. And, um, Morgan Guarantee, my dad said is the best bank in the world. So I interviewed there. Um, People I met were just, just like me. They hired 12 kids a year out of young adults out of Harvard Business School every year. And uh, I just didn't see how that was going to work. Uh, Southern Pacific was interviewing at Harvard. A computer guy was doing the interviewing, and I thought it's really strange that I don't think understand what Harvard Business School was all like, but I figured I'd go out to San Francisco because that's where I wanted to live anyway and interview. And, so that was how I, uh, I ended up at Southern Pacific. How did you choose Harvard over, say, Stanford? Well, I went to Stanford for four years. I had a great time. I went to uh, Stanford in Italy. Uh, that, that, that changed my life. You know, I, I got to go live in a, in a foreign country, and I had to speak Italian. Um, I saw a lot of art and history and architecture that amazed me. and really started this lifelong love I had for art. Um, 
I was I was in a fraternity. I thought that was great. We had wonderful parties. We had, we prided ourselves on having the highest social bill on campus, <laughs> and uh, the uh, and and so I just figured four years was enough. And at that time, I think uh, Harvard had probably a better reputation than Stanford. I don't think it's true anymore. And so I went back east. And did you think about going out to work in between or just jumping, you know, it, today, I know when I went to MBA school, they said we'd like it if you went out and worked for a little time before you come into the graduate school. Did you consider that or do you just want to keep going? You know, I should have uh, because Harvard, you know, is all case study. I mean, and it really, besides common sense and, uh, and hard work, it also takes you know, some degree of knowing and being in instances like that so you can equate that to what they're asking you to do in a particular case. No, but I just figured I wanted to get it over with. There was also a thing called Vietnam around that time. And um, I, I just figured I might as well get go to business school and get it over with. So, and were you in, reg you were registered for the draft, I guess, like we all were. Yeah, I had a deferment. And then after I, I graduated, I went in the Air National Guard. And when you went into the Air National Guard, was that, um, why did you pick air? Any particular reason? Well, it was local. There was one in Hayward, California. And I was so it was working, pragmatic. Yeah, working in San Francisco. And uh, that was fine me. I, I went to basic training in Lackland, Texas, and or at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. I went to tech school in Amarillo, where I learned how to type. And uh, that was tech school. <laughs> that, was, that was tech school. <laughs> the, uh, and you could, you could work at your own speed. I think it was like a four or five months course. And I got out of there 11, in 11 weeks. The, uh, they used to say about Amarillo that you could, it's the only place you could stand knee deep in a snowstorm and get hit in the face by sandstorm. And that, that was pretty close to the truth. Yeah. So anyway, so. So, um, You've joined the SP. Um, you said, I think at one point, that your roommates in school were kind of horrified about going to work for a railroad. Yeah, they, they were, because those were the days when there were serial bankruptcies and uh, everybody thought the industry was dying. And uh, yeah, they took me aside and said, Rob, maybe we understand if you want to go to work in transportation, but don't you know the railroad industry is dying? If you want to go to work for a transportation company, why don't you go to work for a good one like uh, Pan Am or TWA? <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, you've said that when you left, not to get ahead of ourselves, when you left, you really haven't looked back at the industry and that you didn't get into the industry because you had a love of trains or railroads. Um, <clears throat> and you've explained why you ended up at the SP, but was there a tipping point at which you came to really get the industry in your blood, as the saying goes? Um, or was this a job that, because you know, you have a reputation for being a fairly intense and focused individual. Did that come out of just you, you would take that approach to any job? My, my example, when I was asking Judy, Julie about this was if you were making toaster ovens at, uh, for Sunbeam, would you have operated the same way? Or did you really find that you got a feeling for the industry that just, that really got in your blood? Well, that would, that, that would be an overstatement. Uh, that, uh, but I, I'll tell you what did get my attention though. I remember, uh, you know, my first job assistant train master down in Bakersfield, we're probably going to talk about that, but we were building these reefer trains with all the perishables that were going over the Sierras over Donner Pass. And I got to ride one one day and, uh, I don't know, there were three locomotives in the front. There were two locomotives in the back. The whole mountain was shaking and we were, you know, winding our way up in these curves in this beautiful to Blue Canyon, looking at all this beautiful scenery. And you now that got my attention. Later, when I was in Oregon, I had you know, a, a wonderful job, all the branches from the main line out to the west of the coast. And I used to go ride the uh, trains out there, ride the, uh, the locals with the crews. And it was idyllic. It was... Uh, but it was never, yeah, I, I, I just can't leave this place or I, this is all I'm ever really thinking or care about. 
But there's a certain passion that comes across that you have, at least in your book. Um, and I think most people in the industry who know, either know you or know of you say exists in the way you attack the job. And I, I think there's, it almost feels as though it just, it crept up on you a little bit. It didn't, it wasn't by intent necessarily, but that, you, that it did get inside you somehow. Um, yeah. But you know, I think I, I could have had the same thing if I worked for United Airlines or General Motors. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was Maybe the, General Motors even more because I really do like cars. <laughs> well, I, th I thought that was interesting when you commented about a passion for art because at age, whatever it was, 26, when you bought your first painting, um, that's not a common thing to do. Maybe more common is to go out and buy a Corvette or something like that. And this was an interesting Well, I had, uh, I had a Porsche, so that was okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you already had the fast car. Yeah. Um, the training program, um, I went through the NNW's training program in 1972 and 73, and we had about 23 people in it. And the process was to send us out in the field through engineering and mechanical and yard operations and all of those sort of classical things uh, to learn the job. And then you came out as a, an assistant train master. Was, that, was the SP's program similar to that? And yours was longer. I think we were 12 months. Yeah, we were twice as long. Twice as long. Yeah, two years. And, and you covered every facet of the railroad. You started out as a switchman uh, for a summer. And uh, I survived that one day when I fell off the side of a boxcar and broke my wrist. The, uh, and uh, and then the, so they put me uh, at a desk job uh, working on the, uh, the testimony for the Rock Island uh, merger, well, the UP buying Rock Island and then selling the southern half of the southern Pacific. And then I went back and I did it again the next summer. I actually survived being a switchman. I only broke a toe that time and they couldn't fix it. So I just kept working. <laughs> the uh, where, but, where were you working? Well, I started out over in uh, West Oakland at the uh, yard over there. And I, and I had one day of training. The um, so the, this, the switching the, the foreman says to me, get on the side of this car. We're going to shove it up this track. And uh, when we get over the switch, you stop. You, you get off, jump off. He's going to keep and then throw the switch and then we shove it down the other track, shove the car down the other track. I said, how do you get off? He said, just do, do what's natural. So I did. And I put the wrong foot down and I stumbled and I put my my wrist, you know, I, mean, I put my hand out like that and I, my wrist, Crack. I could just tell yeah. it was broken. So we, we took lunch. We all took our lunches and we sat there and uh, the union griever came by and he was talking about, you know, if you ever get any injuries or anything, we got lawyers, we can really help you. And uh, <laughs> I was sitting there with his broken wrist. <laughs> so I didn't say anything. Uh, I went home. I was living with my parents at the time. I said, I got to go see a doctor. So sure enough, I left that office with a cast on and I had to call and say, I just broke my wrist. My dad, who uh, knew the uh, head of uh, the SP law department, Alan Firth. Uh, so he and Alan were talking about that. And Alan said, yeah, you know, if he'd gotten a lawyer, he probably could have got $50,000. But that would have been the end of my railroad career. Right. So right. anyway, that's how that happened. And then the second year, um, when I went back as a switch and I worked a midnight shift in San Francisco and I could tell how that the shift was going to go by how drunk my foreman was when he showed up for work and we'd go shoving uh, boxcars down the middle of the streets because the tracks were right in the streets yeah. and at two or three o'clock in the morning, he'd be up on a, on a top boxcar holding a fusee. And we, there were two breweries, a Ham's and a Falstaff brewery. And we'd stop at each one. All the guys would go in there and have a few beers except me. And there you go. But I survived that. And then another part of the training program was you, you stayed in every department at, uh, at Market Street. The place was full of clerks and you would go with, sit with every general, every chief clerk in every department and learn about rates and about billing and about divisions. Yeah, you know, all that good SDs. stuff. SDs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we were well versed in everything. So when you came out, of the training program, you get assigned as an assistant train master someplace. No, it didn't work that way. The uh, first of all, I was single living in San Francisco, having a great old time in a coach house with uh, two of my old Sacramento buddies uh, up in Pacific, in Pacific Heights. And uh, and that's when computers were just being introduced. 
to the transportation industry. And IBM had a deal with uh, American Airlines to put this Sabre program in right. place for them. And they had a deal with Southern Pacific to put TOPS in for us, Total Operations Processing System. And I figured, okay, I know computers are gonna be important. I'd like to know something about them. I'm really not too keen on going out to Tucum Carry New Mexico and being an assistant train master. <laughs> so I said, can you put me in the computer department for a while so I can at least learn what these things do and, and how you make them work? So they sent me to IBM school and I learned how to program COBOL. And I went into the computer department and I had this, um, the top system was set up so that it only could have one entry for one car. So if you had a, a, a trailer on flat car where you have two trailers, they couldn't identify the two trailers. Well, the guy that was running the, uh, the intermodal department said, this is crazy, I gotta know, I gotta have information. And they gave me the job of designing another program that could be added to this and so then they could, he could trace his trailers around the Was that system. Tom Fanty? Tom yeah. Fanty, yeah. right. Okay. Well, I don't know that Tom Fanty left and my program never got implemented. Wow. <laughs> so, so then I got called in by Dick Spence, who was at assistant vice president of operations at that time. And he was kind of the, uh, the godfather looking over trustees. And, uh, the conversation went something like this, Rob, you're single, you live in San Francisco. I know you're having a good time here. Oh, it's just like that once. Uh, we have to figure out what we're going to do with you. And um, the people who run the railroad in the future won't be the people in the computer department. And I said, young Mr. Smith. He said, so it would probably be good for you and to go out in the operating department. Now, we got this giant General Motors plant right across the bay over here at Fremont. You can be assistant train master over there. You can still live in San Francisco. You can have a great time and you can get some operating experience. I said, yes, Mr. Spence. And then he said, but if you really want to get tested, you'll go someplace where it's tough, where there's a lot of pressure to make schedules. Uh, someplace like the perishable district where if we don't make a schedule, we have to pay the difference if the prices go down to these people who are shipping their potatoes and melons and all the perishables. Said, yes, Mr. Spence. So he said, Rob, I was just like you one time. I knew just exactly how you're feeling. You tell me, what you want to do? And I said, well, Mr. Spence, I guess I ought to just shut up and go wherever you want me to go. And he said, Rob, that's great because Monday you're going to report to Bakersfield. So there I went. <laughs> From volunteer to voluntold. <laughs> yeah. So did you know him before he was in that position? No. So that was your first meeting with him? Well, I, I had met him. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, he was a charismatic guy and he was an up and comer. And, and I had a lot of confidence in, in his judgment and his ability. So when you went to Bakersfield, um, I, I know when I came out of the training program, we were constantly being um, chastised as being college men and, you know, you didn't come up through the ranks and acceptance was a little bit hard. And there was a fair amount of resentment among the people who thought they should have had that position. Did you run into that as well from the field or were you... Did, did acceptance come fairly quickly? Well, in Bakersfield, they were they were used to a lot of young assistant train masters because it was you know, it was it was seasonal, and so they just move a bunch of new people in, and uh, the old head would put up they'd put up with it. Um, my problem was, I just didn't have a good lay of the land. Uh, the first thing is, I, I went down there. I didn't realize they were going to actually pay for my lodging. So I rented this place for 50 bucks a month. It was a little hobble out behind somebody's house. One room had a bathroom. You walked in the door, there was a bathroom on the left, a refrigerator on the right. It was painted pink. There were two pictures of World War II bombers. And that was it. And then I found out later that SP was paying for it. So, but anyway, I was there. <laughs> and uh, the first day I was on my job, they gave me uh, three stations on the main line, the first three coming out of Bakersfield. So what they would do every day is They'd let those people, this was when the potato season was going on, they'd load them, these reefers all day long, cut them off about at seven o'clock at night. And then the pickup train would come out heading north and it would pick up the three stations and keep going until it finally got up to Roseville where they'd build these reefer trains, like I said, that would go over the Sierra mountains to uh, Chicago and, and beyond. And so my three stations were the first three. And if we weren't ready, the train got delayed and, Life was not good. 
And uh, so the first day I was out there and my first station, there was one lousy car of onions and there wasn't a way bill for it. And well, you can't ship a car if you don't have the paperwork. And that's the first place we got to stop and get a car. So I was on the radio and I was kind of yelling at the uh, agent of the office at Edison, I think it was. And in the meantime, a, 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 a brakeman had twisted his ankle or something. And so I picked him up and I took him to the hospital and I said, are you okay? He said, yeah, everything's fine. And so then I went back to work. And uh, so the next, the next morning, I guess I get a call from the assistant superintendent, Charlie Babers. And he says, um, I'd like you to come see me this afternoon. And I thought, okay, I'd be happy to. That's really great. I'm going to meet the assistant superintendent. This guy is about six foot six and weighs something like 280 pounds. And, and he's the, the, the superintendent is a guy by the name of Morris. And he was like a god. We never saw him, but Babers was really running the place. And uh, so I, I, I went in and I sat down thinking he was going to welcome me to the San Joaquin division. And he said, Krebs, I've read your resume. I see you went to Harvard and you're a stumble bum. You're a smart ass and you're just like a locomotive. If you don't work, I'm going to replace you. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I, got, I was basically in tears. And it's because, first of all, because of the Federal Liability Employer Act and this thing about I could have got 50,000 bucks for a broken wrist. When you take someone to the hospital, you, you, it's like your, their mother. You stay there with them. You don't dare leave. Well, I made that mistake. And then he heard me on the radio talking to this, uh, this agent at Edison. So that, I mean, that, that got my attention. And so he I, listened, he heard the radio call to the agent. Oh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I survived. I just said, okay, Mr. Babers, I got it. And, uh, Turned out we ended up being good friends and he worked and I made him general manager of the western end of the road. I don't know, a decade later. He remember the beginning story pretty well? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, well, so how long would you stay? It's seasonal, right? The produce season. Yeah, I was probably there three or four months. And then yeah. and then I went up to Coos Bay. You gave up your fifty dollar a month yep. apartment. <laughs> right. Yeah, I went up to Coos Bay where I was assistant train master. It was a branch line that went from Eugene, which was the operating hub uh, for, uh, for the Southern Pacific in Oregon, over uh, to the coast. And there were a bunch of sawmills and uh, plywood producers and chip exporters. And so they would run a, uh, a train of empties out there every day and people would load them up and then they'd run them back to Eugene and distribute them around, around the whole United States. Yeah, so I, I, but I wasn't there very long either. I don't know how many months that was, four or five. And that's, that was another place they said assistant train masters. I think I was probably still acting at that time, acting assistant train master, but I became train master, assistant train master while I was there. And there's this guy, Arlie Burke, who was the uh, chief, he was the agent, the chief. Arlie Burke. Burke? Yeah. Like the destroyer captain? Well, it was B O U R E G oh, okay. or something. Um, and he would, uh, I mean, he pretty much ran the place and he, he explained to all us new people how, you know, how things worked. And we said, thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, and then they promoted me to uh, train master in, in Brooklyn, which was the yard right outside of Portland. And I had these four or five branches that went over to Tillamook and Toledo and down the, uh, the south in Oregon on the west side of the main line, which went through Eugene. And that was great. And I'd, I, I don't know, a dozen locals every day that would wander around out there. And 16-hour um, jobs. Oh, yeah. And except when I once a week, I would go ride one of them. And they really hated to see me because that meant there were more like 12-hour or 10-hour jobs. Right. <laughs> but yeah, anybody that could make overtime, that was the name of the game. But that was beautiful. And then we would go winding up with these redwood trestles and over the mountains and over to uh, the Pacific Ocean and... It was, uh, it was all apple orchards, and now it is uh, the Pinot Noir uh, wine country, probably best known in the United States. Yeah, right. Yeah. So when you got transferred, did they call you up and say, where would you like to go next? No. <laughs> so it was more like, be there on Monday? Yeah, that was the way it was my whole career. Yeah, I was sitting one day, I was in the book and yard office getting ready to go out somewhere and I got a call from the superintendent, Al Kilborn, and uh, he said, Rob, are you uh, sitting down? I said, no. He said, well, sit down. 
So I sat down and I said, yes, Mr. Kilborn. And he said, uh, Rob, you are now the terminal superintendent in East St. Louis. I said, well, <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Kilborn. <laughs> yeah. Did you know the reputation of East St. Louis? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the second largest interchange uh, in the United States for railroads. Absolute mess. And uh, not only a mess because of the operating uh, problems, but also because crime. of the uh, crime. And, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know how much it's changed. Well, it, I'll tell you how it's changed. All those all those yards are gone. Yeah. I was really offended. I went back after uh, <laughs> being at BNSF to, uh, to the Valley Yard there. Uh, it was the Cotton Belt Yard, and there was just a few tracks left. The tower, we used to sweat it out on, you know, 20-hour days and watch this derailment after that derailment and this problem after that problem was torn down. The yard office wasn't there, and everybody just runs through there now. So... That's the two most interesting things that I read in your book were about your time in East St. Louis and the time in Houston and the fact that you're coming into a hornet's nest. Well, that's probably mischaracterization because hornets move quickly and nothing apparently moved quickly at either place. Could you spend a little bit of time and talk about the what it was like when you got there and the things you did to help improve it, change it for the for the better? Yeah, well, East St. Louis, the first problem uh, I noticed right away was that uh, there was a lot of thievery going on. There was a big Acme uh, shed. Uh, it was kind of like what today a UPS. Uh, yeah, uh, this is LC LCL. Yeah, right at the end of our yard, we used to get 40 cars a, a night on a good night of uh, what later would end up in trailers for UPS that they would be shipped all the way across the country, most of them to California. And while we were switching them out, they would sit there in the yard and then all of a sudden somebody would break a door open, break the seal and loot the car. And it was also well known back in those days, we had all these uh, spaghetti routes and you were traveling you know, through uh, interlockers and the train would have to stop. And it was well known that any clerk in any one of the railroads that was in there, which must have been at least, I don't know, 25 or 30 of us, um, uh, if you were a clerk and you could give somebody the car initial number of a car of cigarettes or booze, you got a hundred dollar bill. And what they would do is they would, um, when, a, when a train had to stop in an interlocker, they'd spot the car, they'd go up right at the front of that, of that car, they'd turn the angle cock, they'd yeah. pull the pin, and then when the engineer could move, he took off and the rest of the train, including that car, stayed behind, behind. And they'd just back their truck up and uh, take whatever they could get. And uh, I know one of the tower operators on the IC right outside of Valley Junction was shot right before I got there. Uh, the guy who ran our mechanical department caught one of these, uh, these trucks in the act with the people trying to steal stuff. So the guy pulled a gun on him and he had to run through one of the houses in East St. Louis out the back door and through the, through the front door, probably that saved his life. So I said, this is crazy. You know, we got customers, we're gonna take care of these customers. This is not gonna happen to people who ship on Southern Pacific. So we had our own police force. I, uh, I got the, uh, the head of it to take me down to Cahokia where the police department sold me a gun. I had a Colt 45, I still got it upstairs up here. And, uh, and he took me out and uh, we went to a practice range and I learned how to shoot it. And fortunately, I put blanks in it because I didn't want to kill anybody and I didn't want to kill myself. But I never had to fire it, but I kept it under the front seat of my car. And that's how I you know, drove around East St. Louis. But we decided then we were going to go out and we were going to stake out our yard. And we were going to catch these people who were doing violence. And we did. And they were our own switchmen. So we got that straightened out. And how, then, many, how many were there involved in it? Uh, about three of them, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't think they ever went to jail. I don't know what happened. And then the other thing was that there was this mentality that, you know, management and workers were opposed to each other. And uh, there was this ongoing tension. And of course, I walk in there, you know, I don't know how old I am at that time, but probably still in my 20s. And uh, I, what, I, what I tried to do was, was to get to know some of these people, and I did. And then we had one Christmas Eve, we had a guy, his name was Bent. And I can still picture him. And we were about ready to switch out the, the traffic for one of the fastest, the BSM, one of the fast trains. And he's coming on duty at four o'clock, supposed to come on duty at four o'clock. And 
I, I wait for this crew to come out of the shanty and get on their engine and go, and I said, nobody's coming out. And I said, well, what happens? Where's, he said, well, Ben's not here. Well, where's Ben? He said, well, you know, he's just, he's, he's here, but he's just, uh, he's just so, uh, upset because it's Christmas Eve and he hasn't got any money to buy a, a presents for his kids. And, uh, I said, well, okay. I came down there. I said, Ben, you need some money? He said, yeah. We went over to the Beanery, which was the hotel on, on our uh, our property that we put up the away from home cruise. Okay. I wrote our check for 50 bucks. I said, give this guy 50 bucks. Go to work. And he did. Okay. Then I was the laughing stock of the uh, the whole Switchman group because he was the biggest, uh, uh, what, what, what do you call it? Uh, the... Uh, well, the, the, the point was I was never going to get my money back, but, uh, but he did pay me back. And that changed. That just changed everything when, when people saw that. And then from then on, we were all kind of on the same team. And then we had Roland Breedenberg, who I actually ended up working with for, I guess, 30 years. He was the terminal, or he was the head of the intermodal department and he's a great guy. And so between him and Qtrel and my, uh, we, we finally got that place to work. We also uh, had railroads build us a lot of run-through trains, so we didn't have to switch cars. We just changed crews on the main line, and that helped us free up the yard. Uh, and then, not only was I responsible for the yard, but then I was responsible for the main line uh, for the first crew district, um, where we had trackers rights over the Missouri Pacific. And that was a big problem because the Missouri Pacific had the DE, that was a Dupo El Paso high speed train for intermodal. And we had the BSM, Goose Creek Merchandise. And we competed. Well, we could get our train, our BSM out on time or even ahead of time. And then the Missouri Pacific took control of it. And they used to have a coal train probably stuck on one of the tracks or something would go on. And the next thing we knew, the DE would be way ahead of us and it would come down to where we took over the railroad and uh, we were in second place. So I had to, I, I spent a lot of time driving around, going to the tower to get us out of Valley Junction. Then I went down, if we were stuck at Dupo, I'd drive down to the train master's office and, and he, you know, he, he didn't like to see me coming. And we finally got that worked out. So we, we, we got everything out okay. Then we had the perishable coming in. About the same time the BSM was leaving, we had to ice some of the perishable because it wasn't all mechanical cars and then deliver them to the Eastern carriers. This was the same perishable that I started out handling in the um, San Joaquin yeah. Valley a, a couple of years before. When you iced cars, did you have to spot them at the ice rack or did you just pull in and- No, no, we had to, we had to, because they were mixed. We had to, I mean, I guess it wasn't every other one, but they were, they were kind of in blocks and we had to shove them in. And uh, so then what I would, then we had the TRRA, which is the Terminal Association, mm -hmm. Rail Association of East St. Louis, um, of St. Louis. They, we had relied upon them to deliver these cars to uh, Norfolk Western or to the Penn Central or to, uh, uh, I guess it would have been LNN or no, the Chessie system. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I would, I would get on their little caboose and I'd ride with them to get these trains over there and deliver to these cars by midnight. So I would go to work at seven in the morning and I, lots of times I'd go home after midnight. And I did that basically seven days a week. So what did you do in your spare time? Well, I didn't have any, uh, <laughs> but I did. I did finally have enough enough time to ask out uh, Ann Lindstrom on a blind date. And that that changed my life. So how did that happen when you're working those kinds of hours? Well, what happened was um, my cousin was uh, married to a doctor and he went back for some postgraduate work, specialty work, I think at University of Washington. And she was working as a secretary at a company. And my to-be wife's father was an electrical engineer in Sweden who helped invent a special kind of hospital operating table. Actually, it tripled as a gurney, an x-ray table, and an operating table. So you didn't have to move the patient. And uh, they wanted to sell it in the U.S. And he came over on a two-year contract to introduce it to American hospitals. And he brought his family. Uh, his mother didn't speak, or his wife didn't speak any English. Uh, Anne had a 10-year-old brother who didn't speak any English. Anne spoke English. She was 
20 years old at the time. And so she came over to help get him settled. And she used to drive her dad to work uh, where my cousin was working, helping put her husband through graduate school. And my cousin called me one day and said, I met this girl, you ought to take her out. And uh, I, I finally had a break. It took, a, it took about a month, but there was a great big meeting. They flew in all the top executives from, uh, from San Francisco and uh, General Motors uh, guys from Detroit. And we, uh, because they were, we were running these auto trains to, out to the assembly plants for, in uh, Southern California and one up in Northern California. And it wasn't working well. And we had a great big discussion about how we were going to build these trains. And then finally, everybody headed for the airport at about four o'clock in the evening. Everything was gone and it was quiet. And so I called her up and I got her mother who only spoke Swedish. She was doing work too well. <laughs> and then uh, and then she came to the phone and I said, oh, it's a little strange, but my name is Rob Krebs. And uh, my cousin suggested I give you a call. And she said, yeah, you were supposed to call a month ago. I said, okay, you want to go out to dinner tomorrow night? She said, sure. So I went over there and I had to get the BSM out first. And I was a little bit late and she was really hacked off. She stayed in the bathroom and she wouldn't come out. Her mother finally went in and told her, get out of here, get out of here. So that was a Thursday. We went out on Off Thursday. to a good start. Yeah. We went out on Thursday. We, we went to this restaurant, Nan Nantucket Cove. We had lobsters and uh, I don't know how we got talking about it. We talked about life in Sweden and she said, oh yeah, so we, can be, we, be, we, we believe in long engagements, two year engagements and this, you know, this is how we conduct our lives. And I said, yeah, yeah like, okay. And we went out Thursday, we went out Friday, we went out Saturday, we skipped Sunday because it was April and I had to get my taxes in. We went out Monday, we went out Tuesday <laughs> and I would, I finally gave her my car because I had a company car and just said, meet me at my apartment because she was in South St. Louis and I was in East St. Louis and my apartment was in West St. Louis. I remember waking up one day. Uh, I remember, well, first of all, when I started taking her out, her dad, you know, after a while, I didn't leave the porch light on because it was light by the time I, we were getting home. And then I woke up one day and I was actually down the freeway driving uh, between uh, West St. Louis and East St. Louis. And I said, this has got to stop. So I asked for a week's vacation. My dad was coming from a banking meeting in New York. He stopped, he met uh, Anne and the family. We flew on, we met my mother. And uh, so that was, that was in May by that time. And Anne was actually gonna go back to Sweden because she just came over to get her, her brother and her mother settled. Um, and then I got a call from, uh, Ralph Kirk, the general manager on the east end of the road, saying he was coming out in his business car and he wanted to have uh, dinner with me. So I told Ann, okay, you got my car. She was driving my little Porsche. Uh, meet me over at my place. I'm gonna be a little late. I gotta have dinner with uh, the big boss. So we, we're sitting in the business car. He says, Rob, I got some uh, great news for you. So well, what would that be, Mr. Kirk? He said, well, you're gonna become the superintendent of the Cotton Belt Railroad in Pine Bluff, Arkansas and you will be the youngest superintendent in the history of the railroad. Whoa, thank you very much, Mr. Kirk. So I went to uh, meet Ann, and she said, Rob, I have some good news for you. And I said, what is that? She said, well, I decided to cash in my boat ticket and stay in the United States. I said, whoa, I said, I'm, I'm moving to Arkansas. And she said, what's Arkansas? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we were engaged in June and married in September. My parents, who uh, only had one Shortened child. the two-year time yeah. My parents, who only had uh, well, one child, a son, my mom got to put on a wedding out in California because you know, the Lindstroms didn't know anybody. So we all went out to California, got married out there. Wow, that's... Make a movie out of that story. Yeah. And it's obviously done well because here you still are. Yeah, we're working on 49 this year. Remarkable, Yeah, I think. Yeah. So how did she take the news about moving to Arkansas? Oh, After it was fine. Arkansas. You know, she was, I mean, she was game enough to decide she wasn't going to go back to Sweden. She, so she pretty much had her life set for her. And she, so go to Arkansas. Why not go to Arkansas? The one I was worried about was her dad because we weren't married at the time. And she was going to come down there and be with me. And this was uh, in the 70s. And so this wasn't, I mean, today nobody would bat an eye. Right. But so I went to him and I said, uh, Mr. Linsom, I'm, 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 I'm I'm headed for Arkansas. Your daughter 
uh, wants to come down there and be with me. And I said, I don't want you to be concerned. And he said, well, Rob, I am concerned. I don't know what that will do for your job. <laughs> I said, I think I can handle that. <laughs> so that's, anyway, we got engaged in June and married in September. Did they um, explain to you how you got picked to go to Pine Bluff? I mean, obviously you're, you're being noticed and picked to do certain assignments. Um, how did, how did that one come Well, out? I think the real question, Brooks, is how did I get picked to go to East St. Louis? Okay. I mean, I, I've barely been in the operating department. That was one of the toughest jobs on the railroad. They had no clue you know, how I was going to do there. But once I got to St. Louis and all of a sudden everything was running, the perishable was being delivered on time, the BSN was leaving early, all the cars were on the train, the yard wasn't plugged. I mean, everything was running. Yeah. Then I could see the next step would be Pine Bluff. Okay. And you liked Pine Bluff? Yeah, we had a great time there. And how long were you there? Uh, a couple of years. I think it was, it was long enough for our first child to be born there. It was probably three years. 1,500 miles of railroad. Um, so we started at East St. Louis. We went down to Corsicana where we connected to the SP for the Transcon route all the way to Los Angeles. We had a line that went off to Shreveport down to Houston to the chemical business. We had a line that went to Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, where there was you know, enough business. And then we had a line from Memphis, which was another place where we got into modal trains from uh, Norfolk and uh, CSX. And they all came together in Pine Bluff. And we built uh, a couple of BSMs, a couple of auto, auto part trains a day, and then a whole bunch of other merchandise traffic. And um, it was a really, it was an ongoing, we were the largest employer in Pine Bluff. The only other thing close to us was the International Paper um, paper mill there. Um, I had my own business car. It was uh, the Fairlane. It was built by Henry Ford for his wife. And uh, I don't know how the cotton belt ended up with it. I used to put it on uh, the back of the BSM and uh, ride the railroad. I mean, it was it was it was a private car, but it was really a business car. And that's what we used it for. The only time I ever took it. I was still in the Air National Guard and I had to go to uh, meetings in St. Louis once a month. So I put it on, uh, on Friday night, I'd put it on a train and we'd go up and we'd park in the yard in East St. Louis. And um, the, then on Sunday, we, we put it on the BSM leaving about 5 p.m. and we wake up in the morning in Pine Bluff. And we had, we had Sylvester and Henry, a cook and a chef, sometime once when we were in St. Louis, uh, Henry took a knife to Sylvester and that, that wasn't too good. They, they couldn't didn't get along very well together. Uh, but they were good people and good cooks and uh, it, was, it was enjoyable. I, I was actually, uh, the, uh, the Air National Guard unit had this little paper they put out monthly and they had a little article there. I, I still have a copy of it that I was probably the only staff sergeant in the Air Force that had its own private business car. <laughs> How often did you go over the railroad in it? Once a month? All the time, all the time. Yeah. And either that or on a high rail. I mean, because we had so many branch lines, that was a much better way to do it. Yeah. But yeah, I, I knew the division engineer, Gary Lilly, better than I knew my wife. I mean, we were on that railroad all the time. But it was generally in pretty good physical shape, wasn't it, when you got there? It was okay. Uh, it, it needed... It, uh, this, this, will, this will take us into another topic, which is how the railroad operated, the whole Southern Pacific, Southern Pacific operated at that time. We had, we had the fountain of knowledge in San Francisco. And their eyes and vision went about as far as El Paso, you know, the Pacific lines. Then there was this thing called the Texas and Louisiana lines east of El Paso and the Cotton Belt, and that was lumped together on the, you know, the east end of the railroad under the direction of Ralph Kirk. And the people who always got everything they needed were the people on the Pacific lines. And uh, DJ Russell, and then later Biagi would make a trip once a year on an officer special across the TNL lines. And somehow those people that were running the place on the east end of the railroad got the impression that it was their job never to ask for anything and never to admit that there was anything wrong with their railroad. So they'd go stash cars out in the boonies, they'd pump the tracks up, you know, they'd go cruising along and Mr. Russell would say, well, Ralph, how's everything? So oh, we're in just great shape here. Well, we weren't. We weren't getting enough ties. 
and the railroad was starting to get weak in some places. We were starting to have derailments. And uh, then I came along, and that was right at the time when uh, Russell was retiring and Biagini was becoming the CEO. And I had been on a couple trips with Russell before because he always started out at the, uh, the Union Station in St. Louis and then came down through Pine Bluff on his way to Corsicana. Uh, but this time I was the superintendent, not just the guy in charge of the first top of the railroad in the East St. Louis yard. And so we, we stop in Pine Bluff, we get back on the train and we're, we're making our way south of Pine Bluff and we get all these uh, kind of horseshoe curves or like it curves one way and then it curves the other way and we got humpbacks and it was rough. And uh, so Russell says, well, what's the matter here? And we, Gary Lee and I, we're just two dumb people. We just spoke the truth. You know, we, we need more ties. He says, well, what do you need? And uh, Lily says, well, we need 20,000 more ties. And Russell got back to uh, San Francisco and we got 20,000 ties. <laughs> and Kirk, you know, he didn't know what to think. He couldn't believe, first of all, that we would say anything. <laughs> and secondly, that we actually, you know, somebody would do something about it. <laughs> So that kind of it kind of changed all that. So next step is, I mean, that's a big job, that much territory, and for a couple of years, what's what's next on the on the? Well, there's another thing I want to say about about the uh, the cotton belt. I mean, it was it had an operating ratio in the '60s, which is. Like those was days, unheard, unheard of. of, you know, yeah. probably, probably the rest of the SP was like a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, we just, we got it so working so well. The one thing was locomotives. And, and it goes back to this thing, the Pacific lines was always taken care of and the TNL lines would get what was left over. And so what would happen if we had 15 trains a day running in each direction and we switched most of them to Pine Bluff. And if you couldn't uh, get them out of the yard, you couldn't take trains in, and then pretty soon the crews would run out of time, the federal law, you know, they'd have to stop work, and then you'd have these trains sitting in sidings and blocking the main line, and, and, and lots of times we wouldn't have enough power. So I devised a system to take care of that. What we did is we never held anything out of the yard, but when we built a train and we didn't have power, we hauled that out to a siding, took the engines off and came back and used the engines for the next train. So sometimes we'd wake up in the morning and there'd be three trains just poised to go to Los Angeles and no power. And I would just say, you know, send us some locomotives. And they couldn't say, oh, crap, your yard is all screwed up. You can't take these trains. You know, I just, there are your trains. And Smith figured that out. And we finally started to get the power we needed. And that's what kept the railroad going. Okay, Interesting so the, strategy. Yeah. So then we, we went down to uh, I went down to Houston as assistant general manager. There, there were three of them, and the one that I was I, I took the place of a fellow who retired, and there really wasn't much work to it. They had Ramsey, who was the head of operations, assistant general manager, and a guy named Calvin Nelson, who was in administration. And I just spent my time down there, which was probably around a year and a half, going out and getting to know the Texas and Louisiana lines and meeting people out there. And I, I had a great time doing that. Um, and it was very helpful later when, when I had to have a responsibility for that area. The funny thing, we went, we, we went down there to house hunting and we had a realtor taking us around. And the two guys who had told me I should never go to work for a railroad were both living there from Harvard Business School. And they told me where we should live. And we went out and looked in this area and we saw a bunch of houses. And, as we were driving around, I saw this beautiful little house, white house with little pine trees on a corner lot with a for sale by owner sign. So I waited till we got done with the realtor, I went back and got the rental car we had. I went over, wrote down the number, I called the people and we bought the house. And a year and a half later, I took that very same sign. I painted out the phone number that was on it, put my own phone number and stuck that same sign in that same corner and sold the house in two days. And I mean, that's, we were there about a year and a half. We had our, our, our daughter born there. Uh, we never really had any roots. We, we just weren't there long enough to do it. And then, plus we were going back to Mecca, which was San Francisco. That was my whole idea in the first place. It only took me 10 years to do it. 
was to work for Southern Pacific so we could live in San Francisco. <laughs> I wanted to press rewind. When, when you were out of the room, I asked Anne a question um, that stemmed from the conversation last night because it was apparent to me and I think to Julie as well that you two seem to have a very collaborative relationship and um, and it seems to work really well. And, and I was curious after 49 years, um, when you were fighting these battles in East St. Louis and in Houston and wherever, were those things that you talked about? Did you run strategy and ideas past her? And, and you know, a lot of people leave work at work and, and home is home. And that's hard to do when you're working the kind of hours you do in the railroad business. So I was just curious about how you, how you used the fact that you were together to help the cause. Yeah, well, she always knew what was going on. I mean, she couldn't help it. The phone would ring at three o'clock in the morning and there'd be a, a tornado that just went through uh, um, one of the stations up above Pine Bluff and derailed one of our trains. And uh, I had to get up and go head out there. And so she was intimately in, involved with the knowledge of what was going on. I didn't sit down to the dinner table and say, you know what, I think if we change the classification this way and oh, okay. we send all the cars to Houston down this track and all the cars to LA down that track, do you think that would make any difference or should we do that? No blocking book dedicated no. to her. <laughs> no, and she probably would, could have cared less anyway. Yeah. <laughs> she basically raised our kids. Yeah. Okay. So you went back to Mecca mm -hmm. or the fountain of knowledge and truth. That's right. And so how did that happen? What what precipitated it? Somebody called up one day and says, we got we need you at headquarters, or how did that occur? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to remember if Spence was still there then. Um, no, I don't, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I think he had gone on to be president of Conrail. So, because the guy, the big honcho there was R.L. King. And I, that was probably uh, Ahern's idea. Ahern was this guy who was, uh, he had an office right next to Biagini. He could actually go in through the back and enter into Biagini's office. Like the West Wing, the chief of staff. Yeah, president. something like that. And he, uh, he was a smart guy, and he was probably the only guy that I know of who could tell Biagini sometimes the things he needed to hear. But he was very uh, circum, uh, well, very judicial about how he did that, because if he, t he figured if he told him too many things, then Bezny wouldn't listen to him anymore. Um, so it was, and Ahern kind of took over the trainees after uh, Spence left. So I think that was uh, Ahern's idea. I mean, everybody knew the 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 job that I had done on the cotton belt, and I got along really well with Kirk and Ramsey in, uh, in Houston. Um, so that was a logical thing for me to go back there. And they kind of created a job assistant vice president for me to, to go back. And, and it was a job where I was basically in charge of nothing. So what did they tell you? We want you to come back and do nothing. I mean, wasn't the... Oh, yeah. I was going to be uh, R.L. <clears throat> King's right-hand man. Um, and, well, he had, I guess he had general managers reporting to him, too. I don't remember who was general manager at the time on the Pacific Lines. Uh, but anyway, AI, so we moved back to, uh, to San Francisco, bought a place not too far from my parents. And um, so I, I was doing my normal job of working for my boss and doing what my boss told me to do. And uh, King was... Um, He'd come up the hard way, and in his mind, he was a—he was like the uh, the general yard master for Southern Pacific. I mean, he'd get on the phone every morning, and he'd call around to all the big terminals, and he'd ask them about the yards, and he'd you know he'd, he'd make fun of them if they didn't do something right, or if they gave him a stupid answer, or if if uh, uh, or if they hadn't accomplished what they were supposed to accomplish, and he had this little group of people who would sit there in his office and he put the speaker phone on and everybody would sit there and chortle. So he invited me in there to that. And uh, 
I was never really too much on the receiving end because I worked on the other end of the railroad. And I think Kirk probably told him, you're going to screw with my road. You call me you know, and talk to my uh, the people that work for me. But I'd heard the rumors and I saw firsthand what a mess it was. And so we, then he asked me out and we, the whole, whole morning. We sit there and we dial our way around the railroad. And uh, then he asked me to go out and have lunch with him. And as you're walking out the door, I, he turned to me and he said, uh, well, I guess we really accomplished a lot this morning. And I just blurted out, I don't know what. And that's the last time I ever got invited to that meeting. And so then I just- Did he me, react when you said that? Yeah, he just looked at me like- uh, Yeah, like that. Uh, and um, so I just spent a lot of time again, getting to know the railroad. I went out and I high railed. I went on all the divisions. Uh, Ann and I were building a house at that time in Hillsboro. I had a lot of time to spend <laughs> looking at that. And then uh, Ahern, I went to Ahern and said, you know, this is crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here doing nothing. This guy that is running this place is a real jerk and uh, you need to do something. So he made me assistant to Biagini. So then I went around carrying Biagini's bags. And I was, when he went to AAR meetings and all that stuff, and Biagini was put on this commission to, uh, uh, it was a government commission, Bud Schuster, who was chairman of the yeah. House you know, Committee of Transportation was the chair of it. Uh, Biagini was a public member and I carried his bags to that. So we went around the country and we hobnobbed. We went to New Orleans so we could look at the at the uh, trolley system. We went to Key West. God only knows what there was in Key West we were supposed to go look at. And uh, it was just a big giant boondoggle. And and some of these congressmen, it was a little shady. I, I remember, I think in, there, in New Orleans, the, uh, the lobbyist for the, uh, for the waterways fix some of these guys up with some young that ladies, entertainment. yeah, that kind of stuff. It was just absolutely a disaster. But anyway, so I did that. And then finally, uh, did you know Biagini before you went to work for him? Well, yeah. I mean, he went to our wedding because uh, oh, he, he was friends of my parents, uh, oh. not really close, but close enough. And, uh, yeah, I, I had seen him on trips, you know, I saw okay. him on a lot of trips. I'd ride the, I get on cause when he had an officer special, when it came to your territory, you got on and sat in the sunset with him. Got to answer all the questions. So, yeah, I, I know him. Why is there a low joint at mile post 332? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Or things like when we were going into Kansas City after we fixed up the Tucum Carry line and he got all upset because we weren't serving George Latour's uh, private reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. I'd be, at the I would have been upset dinner. too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, that came later, but I remember Breedenberg was on the train with me. We walked back to the second car and I said to, because uh, the trip was just going perfect. Everything was, uh, we spent a hundred million bucks fixing up that railroad. It was just like riding on glass, no delays, no nothing. And, so I walked back to Breedenburg, with Breedenburg to the, uh, get out of the sunset for a minute and, and back into the second car. And I said to Breedenburg, you know, it's pretty bad when all the old man could bitch about is the wine we're serving for lunch. And his secretary heard me. And uh, she told me, <laughs> I said that. So I got, when we got back to San Francisco, I got called in the office. And he said, now you just, you'll run this railroad soon enough. <laughs> 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 yeah, that, that was, uh, yeah, but anyway, the, the relationship I had with Viagini was was different than anybody else because I was so much younger and, and, and because I always made a point if I was telling them there was a problem, I would tell them how I was going to fix it. Right. And, and so while I was sitting there running around to, to all these, you know, staying in these fancy hotels in Washington and do all stuff, the railroad was going to hell. And, uh, we had the, the Texas and Louisiana lines, it finally crumbled because of years of neglect and nobody ever saying we need this. And then, um, well then, and then, and then they, I don't know, you said they moved King who, who, this is another thing that Southern Pacific is really good at it. If you didn't do well in one job, they put you in another job. And so you could not do well there. So here we are, we're going through deregulation where we needed marketing, right? So they make R.L. King, the vice president of marketing. I don't know if he knew how to spell it. The, uh, 
But anyway, now we had Alan DeMoss as the vice president of operations, and his main claim to fame was being the purchasing manager. And the, and the Texas and Louisiana lines started falling apart, and uh, the railroad uh, slowed down. I guess they made me general manager then, after I had been assistant to uh, the vice or to uh, Biagini. How long did that last uh, for working for Biagini? Oh, probably a year, year, year and a half. I think I had three years between King and Biagini. And then uh, you said that it was purgatory. Yeah, it was. But I put it to good use. You know, yeah, I, I, like I got to know the railroad and I built a house. So then, uh, then they made me general manager of the Western Lines, and I thought that was a terrific job. I really enjoyed it. Um, but while the east end of the railroad was crumbling, they were shooting all the power out there and everything they could to try to save it. And, and I woke up one day and we were holding, I think, 11 trains for power at Roseville, four trains at Colton, and three trains somewhere else. And the place was just coming to a halt. And the ICC actually uh, uh, gave us a mandate that we had to move every freight car in 30 hours you know, because there were so many complaints from shippers. I thought to myself, I mean, do they really think we're not trying to do that? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and I actually had to go testify eventually in front of a federal judge about the delays to Amtrak. This is, I think, after I became vice president of transportation. Um, but anyway, so what eventually happened is after being general manager, they made, they created a new job which was uh, vice president of transportation. I reported to the vice president of operations, but my job was to uh, clean up the railroad. And so the day after Christmas in 1979, I left on a private jet to go straighten out Houston. And uh, I took with me Bill Lacey, who was another guy who was a fugitive or a victim of the Earl King syndrome. He's a really smart guy, came from Texarkana. He'd been, he'd been a superintendent of the Cotton Belt twice removed before I was. Uh, and Roland Breedenberg and another guy who'd run the terminal at Pine Bluff, Lawn Marsh, and we, we flew down to Houston. And uh, what finally happened is things were, were so screwed up that somebody had to say something about it. And we had this guy, Joe Neal, who was really a character. I know Joe. Okay. They made him the head of... And he was a character. <laughs> you never knew what he was up to. And lots of the time, you didn't want to know. Right. The, uh, they made him the head of marketing in the East End of the Railroad. And he finally told me, I can't sell anything. I mean, we, we don't even have a product. Nothing is moving. Uh, these people hate us. Our customers hate us. So Badgeny got all upset, and that's when he made me superintendent or vice president of transportation. And I went down there with these guys, and uh, Neil knew we were coming, and he he hired a helicopter, and we went out and we flew over the giant Inglewood yard, and all we saw were thousands and thousands of railroad cars. There wasn't that much of a track that didn't have a car on it, and nothing was moving. In the meantime, there were 42 trains set out on the main lines east and west of Houston that couldn't go anywhere because Houston was blocked. So Lacey, he gets this idea. He, uh, he goes into this, the, the middle part of the classification yard and he couples five tracks together. And um, see, this is, okay, this is the day after Christmas. So this is probably right around the first of the year now. And he couples them together and he hauls them out on the Bel Air sub, which is this old branch that we didn't really use for anything. And there were cars in there. There were, there were carloads of Christmas trees. And he just left them there. We, we delivered those Christmas trees in March. And because then he could open up. Yeah, he could open up a little, little, little avenue to get things going. And it took us four months. I stayed down there most of the time. And finally, after four months, I called up one morning and there was not one train set out on the Texas and Louisiana lines. And uh, the, the first thing we tried to do was, okay, we know Inglewood, we, we got to get cars out of Inglewood that have to be switched. So we went over to the, the uh, Lafayette division on the east side and we said to the superintendent, we want you to do is, Every car you get from the east, 
we want you to make two blocks, one for Houston and one for beyond Houston. You got that? Yep, got that. So then we thought, okay, we'll take the ones that don't have to go to Houston. We'll just <laughs> run them right through and go over to San Antonio and switch them over there. So we went over to San Antonio, superintendent. We said, we well, want you to make two blocks. Every car you get that's going east, one block for Houston and one block for beyond Houston. And we'll take the cars that are going beyond Houston right over to Lafayette and we'll switch them there. So we got it. We got it, boss. We got it. We'd come back a day later. <laughs> We'd be sitting in Houston and every car would, would just be all jumbled. <laughs> I mean, we'd call them and say, didn't you get that? And they were so shell-shocked after all this time. They just couldn't do it. Uh, so we, I think I changed out 24 of the, uh, the 26 top operating people. And I didn't fire one of them. Uh, Larry Phipps was a superintendent of uh, Lafayette, Lafayette Division. I went through the training program with him. He's a great guy. We made him the superintendent of Oregon. He did a great job. But everybody was just absolutely... Worn out beside of themselves. Yeah. yeah. So that took uh, it, it took four months to do that. And uh, there were two business car special trains. I remember very well. Where Biagini would start out on this cruise around the railroad, and uh, the first one wasn't too long after I got down there, and we were still trying to clean the place out, and. The train had, I guess it had gone down at maybe deadheaded to New Orleans, and then they were going to get it on the train, but it's going to go all the way out to come back and go through to L.A. And we got close to Englewood, and uh, Lacey is by that time in command. You know, he's, he's not on the train. He's trying to maneuver things, and we had held out of Houston for an hour with the chairman you know, and CEO. And uh, Biagini took it pretty well. Uh, because he could see the progress, and we told him exactly what the situation was. And uh, then a few years later, I guess when I was vice president of operations, or maybe even president at the time, we made the same trip. And except we came, we started out, I guess, in, uh, in St. Louis, came down the Cotton Belt, came down through Shreveport, went to Houston, and then made a left turn and went to New Orleans. And, and the car then, the train was turned around, it was going to, kind of not deadhead because we were on it, but in the night it was going to come back and go back to Houston. And um, so Biagini after dinner, he said, you know, I just want to go back and look at the railroad. And uh, I said, okay, do you mind if I come back and sit with you? He said, no, fine. So there we are cruising along 79 miles an hour, nothing but green signals. The, the, the track is just so smooth. And the moon, you could see the moon and you could just see these steel beams. And uh, Biagini turned to me and he said, I can't tell you how much I, I enjoy this. That's about the nicest thing he ever said to anybody. <laughs> I, I remember when I gave the uh, eulogy at his memorial service, I remember uh, quoting that. Uh, that was the difference between Houston then and Houston at, uh, before that. So. So that yeah, so that was that was the big deal there. I, I, what struck me in 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 that it was a comment I think you made about doing it by inches, right? There wasn't a magic pill or a magic bullet. It was going down and doing everything that it took inch by inch to work your way out of it. And yeah, and there was a lot of things, a lot of smart things that uh, Lacey did. We had all these uh, grain cars coming in, and we had to switch them from all the railroads and then deliver them to the uh, big grain elevator on our property. So Lacey made a deal. Instead of charging 150 bucks, if you put them in a string of cars in a block, I'll let you, I'll, I'll, we'll only charge you 75, and we won't have to switch them in Inglewood. He did that with rock trains. So we had all these, you know, uh, we were probably, you know, hauling rock was, you know, you lose a dollar and make up in volume. Yeah. And but, uh, so he put together these unit trains, but they never even went. The trains just kept turning. They never got switched in Inglewood. We took the satellite yards and we, we turned them and we had, we had all this thing where if you wanted this plastic business, these people that made plastic pe pellets, you had to store the cars because they would keep producing the, the, yep. the plastic and then they would sell it later. So if you wanted their business, you had to have a place to store the cars. And we had them stuck out all over the place and the switch engines couldn't get out in the main line and you know, all that stuff. So we, we took a yard and we made that a storage yard for plastic cars. Our, our cars that are, you know, uh, cover hoppers that have yeah. plastic. Right. It's just little by little, those things. 
we didn't, but the guy before me, DeMoss, he hired a whole bunch of clerks. He built a bunch of tracks and we never ended up needing the tracks and we, we got rid of all the clerks. Uh, so anyway, that was, that was when I was the vice president of transportation. I came back to San Francisco and then got made acting vice president of operations. So that would have been May 1980. Yeah, and that's when the Staggers Act was passed. Right. And that was a really big deal. The industry under regulation, they got fat, done, and happy because we had all this legalized collusion. We had these rate bureaus. And if we weren't making enough money, we just raised the rates. And we, it was just, we all agreed at the same time. We raised the rates and of course, we got more money per car, but everybody started using trucks. So we were pricing ourselves out of, out of business. And then the Staggers Act came along, which was going to uh, deregulate the railroad. And we thought, oh, this is going to be great. Now we're going to be, we can control our own lives. You know, we can, we don't have all this government regulation. And so, yeah, Biagini was all for it. A bunch of people in the railroad industry weren't, but they went ahead and they passed the Staggers Act. And that was in 1980. That's when Darius was the ICC chairman. Yeah, well, he probably had a lot to do with that. Yeah, yeah. well, good for him. Uh, well, of course, the railroad was still, I mean, we were okay. We got Houston straightened out, uh, but we, we had a backlog of maintenance that we needed to do on the railroad. We uh, probably had, we didn't exactly have a shortage of locomotives, but there weren't a whole lot to go around. And then we got the Staggers Act, and we weren't making a lot of money. We probably weren't making any money, really. Uh, but at least we were taking care of our customers and business was getting better and there was a better spirit in the railroad. And then the Staggers Act comes along and what happens? They deregulate pricing. So we used to get 6,000 bucks for a carload of automobiles that we would get in St. Louis and deliver to LA. Now you can go out and you can compete and you can sign a contract for all that business. First contract we signed, we got $1,500 a car. 75% rate reduction. That's what the Staggers Act did. Yeah. In the long run, it saved the industry. So that's when I just started. Uh, I think I cut off 6,000 people in 18 months, 20 months. Uh, so who did the analytics to help you figure out who to cut, take out? Did you have a staff of people that said, hey, we can afford to eliminate these positions? Or was it was it just observation of operations, say? I yeah, it was just me. You know, I would... I would I would wake up in the morning and decide we're going to close the Roseville uh, mechanical facility, roundhouse. Everybody said, you can't do that. I said, well, give, give them five days notice. We're going to do it. We have to because we're, we're running out of cash. And, uh, and we did. Um, yeah, that was, that was also at a time when uh, there, there was this, you know, the railroad had this history of having its own medical department, you know, because when they built the railroads, the railroads had to build hospitals because there weren't right. any hospitals. Well, we didn't have any hospitals anymore, but we still had a chief medical officer. And, and there was a cardiovascular physician in San Francisco who got tired of seeing people when they were about ready to die. And he said, I want to start a preventative medicine um, establishment to help people so they don't have heart problems. He called it Physis, and it was right on the Embarkerdale, not very far away from Market Street where our office was. And a bunch of uh, corporations put a lot of executives into this thing. And our chief medical officer wanted to start, um, at least to have SP try it. So he said, we're going to put five people in this. And, and the first person he wanted to have was Charlie Babers, because by that time, Charlie Babers probably weighed over 300 pounds. And it was a chain smoker. And uh, Baber said, I can't do this. I don't have time to do this. And what you're supposed to do is uh, I think three or four days a week, you, at four o'clock, you'd go down there, put your gym shorts on, and you'd, have, you'd go through exercises. You'd get on a, some kind of a machine, and then they would all tell you, tell you which we didn't pay much attention to, what, what you should eat or what you shouldn't eat. Uh, so the chief medical officer came to me and said, um, I want Babers to go in this thing, and he won't do it. Well, why wouldn't he do it? Because he, he doesn't have time to do it. I said, well, I'll tell you what, you put me in it. And if I have time to do it, he'll have time to do it. 
So we became buddies. <laughs> and we would go down there, put our gym shirts on and do all this stuff. And it changed my life. And I, lots of times I would, I'd be on a treadmill when I figured out what I was going to close next. <laughs> <I just laughs> How did he take to this? He mentoring? did great. He lost 80 pounds. He, uh, he never stopped smoking. Uh, then when the program was over, I know it was over in like nine months or something like that. He stopped. I kept exercising and he gained back all his weight. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, I mean, before we started recording this, I was up there on an elliptical machine this morning and I do that four times a week. My dad had his first heart attack when he was in his fifties. And I figured this, you got it. This is something you need to do. Right. And I, even when I was working, I do it at lunch. Uh, I just, instead of having lunch, I'd go I'd to the we, a gym. We, we, had, we built a gym at Burlington Northern Santa Fe, or took an old building and converted it into one. And even on uh, the Railway Exchange building here in Chicago, there was one machine up on the top floor, and I would go <laughs> use that at lunchtime. But anyway, that, that's what kind of helped get me through this period. Uh, because I, you know, it took a lot of stress out of me. And it also was a nice time to think. Yeah. So. so King was VP of marketing, deregulation comes on. He doesn't sound like a guy that was probably in favor of it, just from what you said. What, how did that play out? Did he stay on there? Did he move out? What, what was his trajectory? Well, I'll tell you what, he was the greatest attribute, maybe it was an attribute, was his dedication to the railroad. And he died one Saturday morning um, of a massive heart attack down in the garage underneath the uh, railroad office building on his way to work. Oh, boy. So I guess I, maybe that was just about the time I became president. But I wanted to get somebody who really knew what marketing was. And I heard this guy, Jack Edwards. Yeah, I remember that who was uh american can no it was not american can california can okay yeah and uh he, he was he was just a whole you know kind of fresh air fresh you know fresh look at everything uh, and they had tried before they'd brought pete vita in who i think had worked for uh maybe ibm or uh, and that didn't work out very well. And uh, we hired guys from Harvard Business School who were going to be marketing experts, and they all got disappointed and left. They were ineffective. Um, but once we got Edwards in there, we actually started to understand what customers were all about and how we could take care of them. And we finally had the wherewithal to take care of them, and that was a big deal. And Edwards and I would set sail every year and go to uh, Japan and China and call on all the steamship companies over there, go to Singapore, uh, go to Hong Kong. And uh, we, we got a lot of business. Well, you guys were the first ones with the double stack yep. train with Sealand. Yeah. So we were, that was moving right along when in, uh, in 1980, Biagini started talking about not really out loud to us, but you know, about merging and he and the board. I guess I was kind of involved in that. I used to get to sit in the board in the back back row and in the board meetings and just listen to what was going on. And we decided to try to merge with Santa Fe and uh, it, didn't, it didn't work. Um, and I think the main reason was because if you put the two railroads together, if, especially if you look at Southern Pacific, we had all this real estate, we had uh, pipeline, if you bought uh, gasoline in Arizona, there was an 85% chance it came on an SP pipeline, either from uh, the Gulf or from the Los Angeles refineries. Um, he had, we actually had bought Tycor, a title insurance company. We never could figure that out. We actually owned a company that made clarinets. I mean, the, yeah, well, yeah, that was that was part of Tycor. We were in the title insurance business. We were in the insurance reinsurance business. We were in all this stuff. Was that an effort to diversify yeah. like some of the other? Yeah, he knew Rocco Siciliano. They were both on the pay board together, I guess, when Nixon was uh, president. And uh, the, the Tycor company was under threat of being taken over, and Biagini swooped in and bought it. We woke up one morning, and we owned this thing. I mean, well, how, how, how does that work? Um, so where was I headed? Um, 
merger time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so the railroad was kind of second fiddle. And even though we got it up and running, it wasn't, wasn't carrying its own weight. And the idea was let's do a merger and Santa Fe was the right one. And so he talked to, uh, John Schmidt, who had taken over from, uh, John Reed at, at Santa Fe. And I think in 80, we came pretty close to a deal, except they were really worried about having to go through the ICC in that process. And they didn't know, you know they couldn't merge until the ICC said, okay, you know, it could have taken three or four years. And what would happen to, to all of Southern Pacific's other assets? Would they atrophy? And so as a result, they, Santa Fe broke off talks. So that was in 80. Uh, so we just kept, you know, plugging along on the railroad. And, uh, in 82, um, that's when I became president of, of Southern Pacific Transportation Company. But they did me the disfavor of having to continue to report to Denny McNear. He had been the, uh, the president and they made him the chairman. He was the president before for, Viagini? You no, know, of the railroad. Okay. Not, not the holding company. Viagini was the CEO of the holding company. And Kenny, okay. I think they made him president of the railroad and he didn't do too well. And of course, I was in there talking to Ahern all the time, telling him about how this is screwed up and that is screwed up and why are we doing this and why are we doing that? So eventually Ahern went, went in that back way and told Viagini, you probably need to make a change. And they didn't have the heart to, uh, to, you know, get rid of McNair, so they just made me report to him. <laughs> Congratulations. I, yeah. So I used to go in and scream at him. I mean, I'm embarrassed now. He's the world's the nicest guy, but he never, didn't have the background and, uh, and, and, he, and, he, and the, I don't know what it was, but so that's when I, that's when I became president was in 1982. So how did that happen? Phone call from Piazzini? What's the settings? Did they give you any advance notice or? No, I, I mean, I guess I complained enough to Ahern that he got Biagini to do it. I guess Biagini called me in. I don't know if Ahern gave me any warning or not. Uh, but all I know is it happened. And, uh. So no big ceremony. It was no, just. No, no, there's no big ceremony at all. And it was, and it was written up in the press releases of, um, then they're stepping up into this job and. Krebs is coming in and uh, then the board was still not, now that, but now by this time I got to go to a lot, all the board meetings. I just sat in the back row every once in a while. They'd call on me to ask some questions, answer some questions. And the board was not content with the SP situation. All these other mergers had gone on. Uh, Burlington Northern had been created. Um, I guess by that time we had the, uh, the mop. UP merger. And when I started out with SP, we were the biggest railroad in the country. And now we were like 15 or something. <laughs> and so they said we needed to merge again. So we went to, uh, we went back to Santa Fe and this time they made a deal. And the way they satisfied the concern of Santa Fe was we'll merge the holding companies immediately. So you can get control of the real estate and the pipelines and all that good stuff. But we'll put the SP in, uh, trust. And then we'll go to the ICC and we will, uh, we'll have an independent SP. There'll be a trustee that controls SP until the merger, which will surely be approved, you know, is final, finalized. And so that happened. And so then what the SP got to do, and it was really a takeover, um, of SP by Santa Fe. And SP got to name the number two guy. And I found out later from R.J. Miller. R.J. Miller was a pillar on the board at SP. He was one of the original Wild Boys, uh, or Whiz Kids or something or whatever there was. Uh, he became the president of Ford Motor Company. He got tired of doing that. He uh, became the dean of Stanford Business School. Uh, and they put him on the SP board. And I found out later from him, okay, so we, we, SP got to name the number two guy on this new Santa Fe Southern Pacific Corporation. And 
they named me the president and CEO. But I found out later from Miller that he actually wanted to name Alvin Firth the uh, <laughs> the, the Southern Pacific guy that uh, came to the number two spot, and the board wouldn't let him do it. So uh, it was kind of funny because one of the last times I had lunch with Biag and he, uh, at the Pacific Union Club in San Francisco, I remember walking out in a rotunda afterwards and OB said some good words and he said, you know what, you never let me down. <laughs> and and I, I said, well, yeah, but you know, somebody else had to give me the chance. <laughs> right. So anyway, that's what happened.